Hello, Chem 101 students. I want to welcome you to our very first real lecture. Uh, it's all going to be in one set today. Uh, usually in, in, during the week I'll have three smaller half-hour lectures that you can watch at your convenience with problems in between. But for this week, uh, because we had the syllabus lecture and because you guys are still probably getting accustomed to what's going on, we'll have one half-hour lecture about chapter one. It's a kind of small chapter. And next week, we'll start to move on to chapter two, which is a much bigger chapter. Uh, so we'll need three, three half-hour lectures for that. Uh, but we're going to just start by defining what chemistry is and talk about how chemistry is a science uh, and what scientists do to gain knowledge in chemistry. So just a very simple uh, statement of what chemistry is, is it's the study of matter, the stuff of the world, things that you can taste, touch, smell. Uh, and also the energy is associated with what happens with these, like when you, when you burn a piece of paper or something, it makes energy. Uh, so that's what chemistry is all about. Um, in addition to learning chemistry this semester, I do have some overarching objectives for you. Uh, as I said, next week is a bigger chapter. It's about measurements. So uh, we're going to learn how to make measurements and have a sense of numbers. Uh, so that's one thing we'll be doing. We're also going to learn how to think like a scientist. This first chapter tells us about how scientists think. Uh, scientists are skeptical and, uh, and often will discard old, old beliefs if the evidence points otherwise uh, that they're, to the fact that they're not true. Uh, I want you to increase, increase your scientific literacy so that you will know how to evaluate scientific statements that happen in the popular media, for example. Um, we'd, I'd like to help you uh, sharpen your study skills. So we're in a very organized weekly time frame, and so I think that uh, following that and, and, uh, and, and following the guidance that I'll give you this semester hopefully will uh, improve your study skills. In addition, uh, most of you are interested in preparing for a job. Uh, and so, um, that's what we'll do here. If you want to be a nurse, for example, you have to take chemistry. And so you'll be learning some of the skills you need for that. If you want to be a scientist, you'll learn some of the skills you need for that. So in terms of chemistry, we said we we're going to study matter. Well, what is matter? Well, everything in the universe is either energy or matter. So energy is something that does not have mass, but it has the ability to do work. So energy, for example, it comes in many forms like movement energy or heat energy, uh, the movement of, of things like the sound. Sound is a movement, a vibration of things, uh, energy. Uh, matter, however, has a mass or a weight, as we would also call it. And you can touch, taste, smell, and feel it. It's there, even if it's just air. I can feel the air that's coming towards me when I move my hands like this. Because it, ha it does have mass, uh, the air, even though you can't really see it. Uh, so matter, another word for matter is chemical. But people usually have a negative connotation towards the word chemical. Uh, but chemical is not a bad word. It's just another word for stuff. Uh, matter, the stuff of the world. These, these terms are interchangeable to science, scientists. So no matter what commercials say, there are no products that do not contain a chemical. Okay, everything's a chemical, even water. And, and there are various, you know, some chemicals are more harmful to living things or human beings in smaller quantities than others. But even water, if you drink three gallons of water in an hour, that could kill you. Uh, so you know, exposure is more about, to, to chemicals, like even water, is more about the amount uh, than it is what, or as much or at least as much about the amount as what it is. So when it comes to matter, matter can be divided. We'll talk more about the way that it's divided and classified, but uh, just to have a general overview here, the large classifications of matter that is pure, uh, not mixed up different things, but pure, uh, is two, two big classifications, elements or compounds. So elements are made out of all of the same type of what are called atoms. So we're going to talk more about what atoms are, but you can think of atoms as the little pieces that make up all the stuff. And there are different types of these atoms, like 
like there are different types of Legos. One's a green one and one's a blue one, let's say. Uh, and and one's, one Lego's bigger than another, uh, but they're all Legos. And the same thing to, is a similar thing for atoms. Uh, so if, if a substance has all the same atoms, it is an element. And we also say that it can't be broken down into, into other things because it's all one type of piece. Uh, pure substances that are made of different atoms bonded together, these are called compounds. And so these can be separated into, into their individual atoms. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that near the end of this chapter. Uh, so all of the elements have been classified into what's known as the periodic table of the elements here. And it does have a kind of funny shape. We'll be talking later about why it has this shape. But you may recognize some elements. For example, silver is an element you might recognize. Whoopsie. Silver is an element you might recognize here. Gold, another element you might recognize. Mercury here. Uh, <clears throat> sodium, perhaps. You don't really see sodium very commonly by itself. A lot of the others may be unfamiliar to you. But we'll be talking more about the elements and compounds which are made of more than one type of element. These elements also have classifications based on their colors. We're going to come back to those classifications, but eventually I want you to be able to talk about these classifications and know what they are. And to know, for example, all of these are called alkali metals, and all of these are called alkaline earth metals here. And there will be test questions about that. Uh, here is a different type of periodic table of the elements that has pictures of the elements. So again, you can see like gold right here and silver, copper uh, elements you may, be, may know. If you take a look at this table, I like this table because it shows pictures of all of the elements. And you can see that from about right here, right about here, all the way to the left, all of these seem to have similar types of properties. Take a moment and think about what's similar between these. They all seem kind of shiny, and a lot of them are, are silvery color, gray color, shiny. Uh, these are properties that indicate to you probably that these are metals. So you'll find is that most of the elements are in fact metals. Uh, and metals have particular properties. They, they conduct electricity, like you can have a metal wire that conducts electricity. Your pan, pots and pans are probably made out of metals. They, get, they conduct heat, they get hot uh, on the stove. And so those are the kinds of properties that make a metal. You can usually bang them and they will bend. Whereas if you, if you hit a piece of something else like charcoal, which is made out of carbon, or if you hit a diamond really hard, uh, they will break. Diamonds, it's hard to break them, but they will break and shatter instead of being bent. But metals get bent, and there are reasons for this. So as we move on, we'll talk about the reasons why uh, element, metals are different from non-metals. But you'll see that most of the elements here are metals, all of these from here down. And only the top corner here are non-metals. These are the non-metals, relatively few of them, right in here. If you want, going back to the previous table, you can see the dividing line. These blue ones are called semi-metals. They're between the metals and the non-metals. And then all the uh, dark blue and purple ones here are non-metals. And then the rest, all the way over here, are metals. So those elements and compounds, those were considered pure substances or pure types of matter. We can also take pure types of matter and mix them together. These are referred to as mixtures. Uh, so a mixture will contain one or more pure substances, which are elements or compounds. They can either be mixed very uniformly, which we will call homogeneous or homogeneous, or unevenly, which we call heterogeneous. Homo meaning same, hetero meaning uh, not the same. Okay. Uh, and genius is referring to how they mix. And so this is a diagram from your book, figure 1.6. Uh, if we have element and compound, element or compound, if it's not a mixture, it's just one substance, either element or compound. If it's more than one, 
It's a mixture, either a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture. So on a very microscopic level, uh, homogeneous mixtures are different from heterogeneous mixtures because they're uniform throughout, even on a very small level. Uh, and so uh, you can think of, for example, a, uh, a glass of salt water once you stir in the salt. So that looks very homogeneous. It looks clear. You can't see uh, any difference between any one part and another. Uh, this is a homogeneous mixture because all the parts are evenly distributed. Uh, and so it's even throughout. So any part has the same composition, which means if you took a salt glass of salt water and you took a spoon off the top and you tasted it, it would be salty. And if you took a spoon off the bottom, it would be the same amount of saltiness because the salt is evenly spread all throughout the, the mixture. This is as opposed to a heterogeneous mixture. So heterogeneous mixtures will look cloudy or they'll have like floaties like this, little particles, okay? Uh, so a mixture has an uneven distribution of, of the, the components that, that it has. It will often settle into layers uh, if you leave it to sit. So an example would be like oil and vinegar salad dressing, uh, Italian salad dressing. So if you if you shake it up it will be well mixed but then as you uh as you let it sit on the table you're eating dinner or something and you let it sit on the table uh it's going to settle out and so uh and you'll get layers and so this is an, a heterogeneous mixture so hopefully you wonder why do some things make homogeneous mixtures and some things make heterogeneous mixtures? How come some things mix so well and some things don't? And that's a question we're going to answer as we move along through this class. So uh, what, when, as we move on, not, in the, not so much in this chapter, so this is a little bit different from what they show you in the book, but I just wanted to kind of give you a preview of the way that we write down symbols that represent elements so on the periodic table you saw some some symbols like where gold was it said au au is gold well that's strange right that gold is au if we go back i'll just go back a second here you saw au is the gold gold and so you may wonder why is it au well it's because for some elements that were known a long time ago the symbol that we use to represent them comes from latin because uh, people knew about this element for so long from so long ago they had a name for it in latin and the name in latin for gold was aurum aurum which meant shiny uh, and so that's why its symbol is au and silver was called argentum in latin and copper was called cuprum and so and so that's why uh so gold here gold silver Copper. Copper was called cuprum. And so uh, that's why they have these, these symbols here. Um, so others, they, they're, they were known more modern, in more modern times they were discovered. And so they have symbols that make more sense, like Li for lithium, or uh, you know, He for helium right here, Li for lithium. But sodium is Na. This is because uh, it comes from the Latin name natrium. Okay, and so uh, here we have several symbols for different elements. C is carbon, SN is tin, CO is cobalt, and AL is aluminum. Uh, aluminum is, is quite valuable, so we recycle it. Uh, yeah, make sure to recycle. That's good for the environment. Uh, compounds, now the way compounds are gonna be written, so you've probably seen H2O as a compound, water. Uh, which is indicating that it, in this compound, it will have two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Hopefully you're like, what is an atom exactly? We're going to get to exactly the description of an atom. But again, just think of them as little pieces right now. So in water, there's two little pieces that are identified as hydrogen for every one little piece that is oxygen. And that's why we have this formula written in this way, H2O, and this is called a chemical formula. Uh, there are some other examples, CaO, 
CA is calcium, O is oxygen, so we, that's a symbol for a compound with calcium, one calcium for every one oxygen. SN is tin, CL is chlorine, so this is the, and we got two of them, two chlorines for every one tin. Or CO, carbon and oxygen here, one carbon for every one oxygen. This is called carbon monoxide. You probably have a carbon monoxide detector in your house. Uh, so this is the way that we represent compounds on, on, on in the written form. And we'll be using that a lot as we move on. They don't really talk about it much in the book, in the textbook, so I don't ask you about it, but I just wanted to give you a little heads up. Uh, and as I said earlier, mixtures, they come in heterogeneous or homogeneous uh, mixtures. Uh, so we got two examples here, salt water, salt and water. Uh, water is H2O, that's its formula. Table salt is sodium chloride. Its, it's uh, formula would be NaCl. Uh, if you mix those together, you get a homogeneous mixture. They mix very nicely. Whereas if you try to mix oil and vinegar or oil and water, you'll find the oil floats on top of the water. Hopefully you got lots of questions about this, questions we're going to talk about. Like, why does salt and water mix so much easily? You just stir it up and the salt just mixes right in there and you can't see it. But oil doesn't. And why does the oil fly, float on top of the water or the vinegar, which is mostly water? These are questions that you're going to get answers to in this class. And uh, I think that's what's uh, something that's so great about chemistry is you start to look at all these daily things that you took for granted and really understand why they are the way they are. And we're going to go into answers like that as we move forward in this class. So I have an example problem for you here. At this moment, I think you should pause the video and think about these questions. And then uh, after you pause, Think about them, get an answer, and then unpause, and, and I'll, I'll explain to you the answer. Okay, so you should have unpaused now. And uh, this is actually a question on your homework, too, uh, but I wanted to talk about it in the class. You'll be writing the answer, but if your water, a friend called water a chemical, how would you respond? And well, the answer is that water is a chemical. All matter is a chemical, and water is matter. Uh, chemical is not a bad word, okay? Uh, wa so water is a chemical. It, it's a matter. You can tell it has weight. It takes up space. Uh, you can you know, touch it, taste it, feel it. It's matter, so it's also a chemical. Uh, looking at these, what would you describe them as an element, a compound, or a hetero heterogeneous or a homogeneous mixture? Well, a silver dollar coin, that's assuming it's made out of pure silver, well, silver is an element, and so this would be an example of an element. Uh, ethyl alcohol might have been the hardest one, uh, so because you might not know if that's an element or a compound. It's actually not an element, uh, but it is pure. It's, a, it's, called, it's drinking alcohol, ethanol as it's also called, and assuming that you have pure alcohol, that would be a compound. Uh, seawater. Seawater uh, is a mixture. Uh, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous probably depends on where you're at. Uh, if you're at, you know, Huntington Beach where it tends to be stirred up and there's sand and there's seaweed in it, well, it's a pretty heterogeneous mixture. If you're in a very, uh, you know, calm beach with no waves and it's, it's very smooth, maybe it's quite homogeneous. Uh, but it's probably, in most cases, seawater is a heterogeneous mixture uh, if you're at the beach. So that could be either C or D. Uh, maple syrup. Now, maple syrup, if you, if you look at a bottle of maple syrup, the maple syrup that's on the top of the bottle is going to be similar to the maple syrup that's on the bottom. It shouldn't be any different. This mixture is completely the same throughout. And so this is a homogeneous mixture. We know it's not a compound because... We, we know it has water in it and sugar, right? So water is a compound, sugar is a compound. It's a mixture of these compounds and a lot of other things. So make maple syrup is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, now, in terms of 
Describing matter, matter comes in phases or states. There are three main phases. We Sometimes people talk about a fourth, but uh, in this class we'll, we'll discuss only the three. So uh, we have solid, which has a definite volume and shape. Uh, so this is as opposed to a liquid. A liquid has a definite volume. You can't squeeze it into a smaller volume. However, its shape is not definite. It will flow in order to take the shape of its container. So it's a fluid. Finally, gases, they have neither a definite volume or shape. If you, uh, if you have, for example, um, the, the gas in your tire, the, in your car tire, well, if you press the little nozzle, that gas will start to escape from the tire and expand to fill a whole space outside the, the air. Where, but if you want to fill up your tire, you can put more gas, you can squeeze more gas into the tire. And so you can squeeze it into a smaller space or you can let it out into a larger space. And it doesn't take, if it's in your tire, it takes the shape of the tire. Or if it's outside of the tire, it just goes wherever it wants. Uh, that's the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So why are they this way? Well, solids, they're, solids are the way they are because they have a strong attraction between the particles. Hopefully you're wondering why. Why do things that are solid have a strong attraction between the pieces of the particles that make them up? We will be talking about this as we go forward. And I'm going a little bit into more detail than your textbook does here, but just a bit. Uh, your textbook does mention solids, liquids, and gases as the states of matter. Uh, in a solid, the particles are very clo in close contact with one another. They move very little. In a liquid, the particles uh, are, are, they have a medium attraction to one another. They are, all the particles are moving around. Uh, however, the liquid particles, they don't stick together as well. So the particles can move around each other, but they're still quite close together uh, compared to a gas. Their, their freedom of motion is, is in the middle. Finally, for gases, the attraction between the particles is much weaker than their energy for their motions. They're moving around. These particles have a lot of freedom of motion. They're far apart from one another. Uh, and that's shown by this picture. So in a solid, they're very orderly. They're stuck together. In a liquid, they're not as orderly. They can move around one another, and they take the shape of their container here. This is a solid, very orderly liquid. Uh, they can move around one another. And in a gas, they're actually very far apart from one another compared to the liquid and the solid. And they expand to fill the shape, the volume, and have the shape of their container. They have neither definite volume nor shape. Now, I... I, if you go to, uh, so I have a website called Lemchem, or Lemuchem, but Lemchem for short. If you go there, you can see a simulation of solids, liquids, and gases here. And this is that simulation. It's taking a second to start. Oh boy. Well, scratch that. <laughs> Guess we'll have to deal with, use the pictures. Uh, but these are the pictures here. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure why that's not working right now, but this gives you an idea of the way the particles behave. So um, now in describing matter, besides the state of matter, we may also want to describe the properties of the matter. Uh, we divide these into two large classes, physical or chemical. So when we're talking about the physical properties, we're talking about the properties of the substance uh, without it changing into something else. Okay? Uh, the chemical properties describe how the substance could change into a different substance. And so when we describe physical properties, we would, say, we would uh, refer to things like their, their state of matter, whether they're solid, liquid, or gas, their color, their shape, taste, smell, that kind of thing. Whereas a chemical property is, is for example, if, uh, 
you know gasoline will burn. That is a chemical property. It will burn and it will change into something else. Or if you mix baking soda and vinegar, you get bubbles. You guys might, may have done a baking soda and vinegar volcano and bubbles come out. So you can usually tell uh, uh, this, that um, you know, when, when something like that happens. So when, when you do see the action of a chemical property, we, we call that a chemical change or a chemical reaction. So when the, the, the wood here or gasoline is burning, we say that is a chemical change. And the fact that it can do that is a chemical property. Uh, and physical, prop, physical changes involve changing of a substance from one uh, physical state to another, but it doesn't change what it is. So for example, if you, if you uh, boil water like this, okay, uh, that water that you get as steam, that is still water. If you collect that water and drink it, that, or drink the steam, it would be kind of dangerous, but you would, it would taste, it would smell like water, because it is water. It's just water in the gas state instead of in the liquid state. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the difference between chemical properties and physical properties, also chemical changes and physical changes. So let's do a few more here. So given what I told you, again, pause the video for a moment. And after, uh, so after you pause, I'll, I'll uh, talk about the answers to this. So take a crack at whether these are physical or chemical change. Pause the video now. Okay. So uh, chewing a cracker. Uh, well, if we're chewing it, we're just crushing it up. And so it's just being broken into little pieces. It's still a cracker. So this is a physical change. Now, my biology people out there might know that actually digestion begins in the mouth, though. So, because your saliva can start to break down the starches and the, cra and the crackers into sugars. Uh, so you could say that a chemical change is happening in the mouth, too. But it's mostly a physical change. It's just being crunched up. What about digesting a cracker? Well, when you digest anything, what you have at the end is definitely not the same thing you had at the beginning, right? Also, chemical reactions are happening or chemical changes that release energy that powers your body uh, during the digestion of this cracker. So digesting a cracker is definitely a chemical change. Uh, melting a piece of cheese. Again, depends on what you're thinking of melting. If you're just melting it and you're not burning it, well, then it's a physical change. It's just going from solid cheese into liquid cheese. You can tell because it till, still tastes like cheese. It still smells like cheese. It is cheese, just liquid instead of solid. Um, or melt it around on your chips or whatever, or on, on your sandwich. Uh, if you burn it, though, if it turns brown, that is a chemical change. So you can often tell a chemical change because you get a new substance like the bubbles that we talked about before, or you get a browning, or, or you get a, sorry, a changing color like the browning or this, this cheese. Uh, and so a color change or like a, a presence of a new substance like gases, bubbles, or something will indicate to you that a chemical change happened. Finally, turning sugar into caramel. Well, again, I made these kind of vague. Clearly, there's still sugar left in when you turn sugar into caramel, but you can tell that it doesn't look the same. You've had a color change, okay? If you, have, you make caramel by putting sugar in water and then you, you heat it up for a long time till it turns brown and thick. And uh, the fact that it's changed color to a brown color to make the caramel tells you that this was a, a chemical change. Uh, maybe not completely, there's probably still some sugar that wasn't changed in there, but it's definitely something changed because the color changed. Uh, so finally, for the last part here, we'll talk a little bit about atoms. We're not going to get into too much detail, uh, but I just wanted to, to kind of define very simply what an atom is. I like to start a little bit early with atoms compared to the textbook. An atom is the smallest part of an element that still have the properties of that element. So a, a pure element only contains one type of atom. 
A compound will have two or more of these types of atoms. And again, you can think of those like Legos for now. Okay, you have a blue one, which is one type of Lego, and a, and a red one, which is another. And they can connect together in certain ways, right? Uh, except these Legos that build up the whole world are very small, extremely small. So, so small you, you cannot see them. Uh, if you had 254 million of them lined up, they would only be one inch. That's how tiny they are. So atoms are, are very, very small. Uh, <clears throat> most, ele uh, you know, many elements in nature, not most, but many are found as individual atoms, many metals, zinc, for example. Uh, if they're elements, they will be individual atoms. Some elements come in what are called molecules, which are groups of atoms. Uh, these include the ones listed here. Uh, an element cannot be broken down into a simpler substance because it has only one type of atom. The way substances are broken down, or the way compounds are broken down into simpler substances is this way. If you have a compound like boron trifluoride here, that's what this is, and it's being represented by four atoms. This orange one is the atom that the boron type. And the yellow ones are the type of the atom that's the fluorine type. Compounds have more than one type of atom in them. So if we were to heat this up or, or do, do some type of chemical change to this, we can make the atoms separate from one another. And that's why you can break compounds down into simpler substances. So compounds, though, can only be broken down by a chemical change. So what you have here in the end, these elements, are something that is completely different from the compound that you started with, okay? And uh, so, and it's because the atoms have now been separated from each other and they make something that's not at all the same. We'll be talking more about that as we move forward. Mixtures, however, can be separated by a physical change. Uh, it depend, depending on which type of mixture, you'll have to do a different type of physical change. So for heterogeneous mixtures, these are pretty easy to separate. Uh, you can think of like coffee grounds and water. You put the coffee grounds with the water and then they separate by passing the, the watery part through a filter and the coffee grounds stay in, above the filter. Right? Uh, they can also be separated by decantation. What this means is if you have two layers of things, you can pour off the top layer and leave the bottom layer. Uh, homogeneous mixtures, however, are a little bit harder to separate. Um, so, for example, if you have salt in water, you can't just pour it through a filter like this. Instead, you have to evaporate away the water. And when we get to experiment one, you'll see some, uh, some examples of this lab, the online lab. Finally, we want to talk about the scientific method. Uh, so scientific method is basically how scientists think. It's a, way of, of, it's a way of figuring out things about the world. It emphasizes observation and experimentation, uh, getting, getting knowledge by looking at things. This is as opposed to just thinking about things. So in the old days, you know, thousands of years ago, sometimes philosophers would sit around and try to think Hard enough to know about the way the world works. But over time, people started to realize that the best way to find out the way that the world works is to actually look at it and test things. Uh, and so what scientists will do is take a sample or a small part of the world and take a look at it and, and study it because it's hard to study the whole world at once. So they take a little piece and study that piece. Key to, uh, to doing the scientific method is observation. It centers around observation. Observations come in two basic types. Qualitative observations, qualitative referring to the qualities of things, uh, so rather than how much. So we're talking about things like color, scent, uh, its shape, um, things like that, things that are not described by numbers. Quantitative observations are those that are gotten by measuring their numbers. Uh, so the length of something, the weight, the volume, how much space it takes up, things like that. Anything that you can describe with a number is a quantitative 
observation. So in the lab, we're often doing both, uh, especially though one thing I'm going to teach you a lot about is how to make accurate quantitative observations in the class. So uh, knowledge comes in science comes from observing things with your senses or with the machines that will you know work in place of our senses. Senses uh, observations involve uh, measuring or observing something either qualitatively or con uh, or quantitatively. Once enough observations are made, you may start to think that you understand what's going on with this little piece of the world you're looking at. So these are tentative, a hypothesis can then be formed, a tentative interpretation of your observations, or an educated guess, as it's also called. Uh, finally, if there's a lot of observations um, that, that all seem to indicate one thing, they may then be elevated to the status of a law. So a law is a bunch of observations about the world that, uh, that have not been violated. They appear to be true. However, a law doesn't usually tell you why this thing is true. It's just some, a bunch of observations people have made that appear to always work in this particular way. Then there are the even higher level of knowledge, which is theories. The so theories actually try to explain why observations come about the way they are. So they're explanations for, uh, for laws and other observations along, uh, uh, that come from a great variety of, of observations and experiments. In general, the way this, the scientific method focuses on observations. So you look at the world, you take some observations around about it, and then you start to come up with an idea, a hypothesis. Then you make an experiment to test that hypothesis. If it confirms, you keep your hypothesis. If, if the experiment tells you that the hypothesis was wrong, then you revise or you change your hypothesis. Even if this is something you really, really thought was true. If experiments repeatedly tell you it's not, then you have to be willing to give it up. That's what it means to think like a scientist. Observations, uh, if enough of them happen, and, and, and are, are confirmed with one another, then they can be elevated to the status of a law, right? But a law will be tested and confirmed as well. If the law is, turns out to be wrong, well, then it's now no longer a law, it's a hypothesis, and we have to test it some more. Finally, if we have a bunch of hypotheses that all are telling us a certain thing, and we, we find a an explanation for all of these, that is now a theory. So the theory can explain the laws or the, and the hypotheses, uh, and we continue to test that explanation and see if it's consistent with what we observe. And that's the scientific method. Uh, so scientific theories are validated by experiments. Uh, if, if we ever find that experiments are starting to tell us that we were wrong, that the theory or the hypothesis or the law is incorrect, then these must be discarded or changed in some way. That's the way science works. And this happens, this is how science develops. Uh, there, are, there have been times where we thought, we, the people who were doing science thought they were getting to the end of science and figured everything out. But then uh, some new observations that were unexplained lead to a new theory that can explain them. And now the old theory must be discarded, even if you loved it a lot. Doesn't matter. That's not the way science works. In science, once the evidence is telling you, that the, the results of your experiments are telling you that you have to change your theory, then you change it. Poor theories are eliminated, good theories remain. Uh, an example of a theory is the atomic theory. It explains lots of different observations in chemistry and physics. So the fact that there are small indestructible particles or pieces, we call them atoms. In fact, this theory has been revised since uh, Dalton came up with it because we found they are not indestructible. You can destroy atoms, but it's just very difficult. So that's an example of a theory being revised. The atomic theory is different now than it was back when Dalton first proposed it. Uh, and so it's a theory because it goes beyond laws and hypotheses to actually explain many different observations. Uh, 
It's important to recognize that the word theory in science is something different than in regular language, so is law. Uh, so in, in regular language, if someone says, I have a theory, they usually are referring to something that's more like a hypothesis, like, oh, I have a guess, you know. But in science, a theory is not a guess. A hypothesis is the word for an educated guess. A theory is a very, very well supported. And uh, well-tested theories are, are basically as close to truth as you get in science. So the theory of evolution, right? Uh, very, very powerful theory that explains a lot of different observations. It, 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 is, it is some of the highest level knowledge that we have. It's one of the most valuable theories. But it's been revised many times uh, because when new information comes, we revise our theory. We don't leave it. Just hold on to it. We, we revise it. Okay. And so that's the end of chapter one here. And uh, so now you should move on and do the chapter one homework. I'll also have a video for you with an algebra review and the, um, the uh, graphing exercise for this week. Uh, so we're kind of reviewing some old math concepts as well. And so I'll see you guys on the next video.